Coming up, he's one of the unique voices of the American West, an interview with Dr. N. Scott Mamaday, next on Dialogue. Funding for Dialogue is provided by the Friends of Idaho Public Television, the State of Idaho, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Good evening and thanks for tuning in. I'm Marcia Franklin. My dialogue this evening is with a man who has recently become familiar to millions of Americans as one of the resonant voices in the PBS documentary series The West. But for more than 30 years, Dr. N. Scott Mamaday has captivated readers with his tail spinning. Part Kiowa Indian, Mamaday writes about memory, his, and his peoples. His pen chronicles the nexus of Indian and white, of primeval and technological. Indeed, his very first novel, A House Made of Dawn, chronicled the life of an Indian stumbling between the worlds of his ancestors, of white society, and of his own mind. It won Mamaday the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1969. Since then, he has published numerous works, among them The Way to Rainy Mountain, In the Presence of the Sun, which is a collection of poems, and The Names, a memoir. He's also a university professor, and an accomplished artist. This is a man who, in his own words, likes to keep his mind active by experimenting with many creative forms. He's in Boise to address students in the Asia University in America program at Boise State University, and I'm happy to have him with me this evening. Thank you very much for being here. You're welcome. You know, the very <clears throat> beginning of the series The West contains a quote by you saying that the West must be seen to be believed and believed to be seen. I think most of us who've lived in the West or traveled through the West understand what you mean by seen to be believed, because it's spectacular. What are some of the things you meant when you said that the West really needs to be believed to really be seen? I think that the West <clears throat> is an object of belief. Uh, people uh, must deal with it on those terms. <clears throat> so if you bring with you the willingness to believe, you can see it more clearly. That's, I think that's the basic idea. And what, <coughs> what must we, we believe about the West? For each person, I assume it's, it's different, is it not? I think so. Um, well, there are many levels of belief. The, the West engenders belief of all kinds. People who had read the dime novel, you know, and then set out for the, for the West um, had one kind of information, one kind of belief. The people who lived in the region, the Native Americans, had a deep belief in the landscape and its sacred aspect. Um, Europeans coming for the first time to that vast and legendary landscape had <clears throat> other requirements of belief, so varied. Do you feel that there's, there are some people who, because they don't believe or haven't gone past a surface level, really don't see the West? Absolutely, yeah. And, and I'm sure that, uh, th that applies to a, a, a large number of people. Many of us don't see what, what's around us, you know, and that's certainly true of the West. People have a superficial uh, perception of it. They don't see beneath the surface. But what is beneath the surface is worth seeing. You've also talked about uh, mm -hmm. modern society as really not seeing past a lot of the superficial, past a lot of the signs and advertisements and kind of mess, maybe, mm -hmm. to what you consider to be more real. Mm -hmm. What is that? And, and you've expressed in, in your writing that you feel Native Americans often do have this sense or do see mm -hmm. that reality. In order to, to perceive the West in its terms, um, <clears throat> one must see into it. You know, I had a remarkable experience a few years ago. I was, <clears throat> I lived part of the time in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And between Santa Fe and Albuquerque on that stretch of highway, I once saw a billboard that was the, that was a depiction of the landscape. And it was an, a, a fairly accurate depiction of the landscape beyond it. And I thought, this is wonderful, you know, here someone has constructed a superficial 
um, <coughs> picture uh, in cardboard that <laughs> reflects the reality behind it. So the people uh, would actually maybe stop and see the <laughs> billboard with that reality yeah, rather and than... The, exactly. And the point is that a lot of people perceive the billboard. That's what they see of the West when the reality is really beyond it, deeper than, than the billboard. Certainly the series The West has explored <laughs> some of those realities which are quite complex, mm -hmm. sometimes contradictory, mm -hmm. uh, many times ironic. Uh, there is throughout the series a thread of Native American being, culture, mm -hmm. voice. Uh, it has been several decades, maybe since the 60s, I would, I would guess, since there has been this, uh, I don't know if we call it a fascination with Native Americans, but there's been an increased attention to it. There was recently a study that I read that said that, in fact, more people now in America are identifying themselves as Native American than ever before, which is interesting. Um, I'm wondering, as a Native American, when you s see this, do you ever feel it's too little too late? I mean, that, that, that it's easy for people to have this attention or pay this attention to a culture which, um, you know, when we were at war with, we were not, as look, did not look so kindly on? Is it? Uh, yeah, I think, I think, um, I think uh, there has been um, um, an awakening interest in the Native American and in the West. In my lifetime, certainly, it's accelerated a great deal, probably beginning about the 1960s. Um, people became suddenly very much interested in the environment. The Native American has always known how to live on harmonious terms with nature. So we began to understand, I think, that the, that the Native American had much to contribute to, to the betterment of, uh, of society and of the world. And so we have begun to see him as, a, as an example to be followed. The, the, the American Indian has been in this landscape for 30,000 years. You've talked about, or I believe you've written about, that there's kind of stages people have gone through, morality of intolerance towards Native Americans, then pity. <laughs> what, what stage would you say the American public, which is often reflected in our history texts, is in with the Native American with the first Americans? I think if I had to pick one word or one characteristic it would be appreciation. Um, I think that the non-Indian <coughs> has begun to appreciate the, the Indian in ways ne as never before and uh, that is all to the good. I mean, we, are, we are beginning to understand that uh, this this person who has, who has uh, lived for many generations in this landscape is in a position to tell us, the rest of us, something about ourselves, uh, is in a position to make a contribution. We can, you can list a whole category of things that uh, the, the, the Indian stands to contribute to our society. His uh, understanding of language is, uh, is very highly developed. The Native American oral tradition is one of the richest traditions in the world. And we can learn a lot. I, I'm personally interested in that, of course. It's one of my subjects. But um, <clears throat> we have now to revise in a critical way our understanding of American literature. It didn't begin in the 17th century in New England. It began 2,000 years ago with a Native American depicting something on the face of a rock. That's writing. And so that's where literature begins in America. You mentioned language and an oral tradition. Did the great <coughs> oral traditions of the Native Americans keep them, ironically, from being uh, established writers for a while? Um, did that oral tradition well, keep, in, in keep the stories just verbal as opposed yeah. to being written down? <coughs> in the sense that, that, they, that they originated at the level of the voice, not writing. And they have persisted uh, at that level until very recently. Now we have a burgeoning uh, generation of, of Indian writers. Uh, this, it's astounding, actually. It's, it's happened overnight, but there are very exciting uh, things being written by Indians now. And the publishing world has, has realized that there is a great market for that. People want to read you know, things about Indians by Indians. It's interesting you mentioned the publishing world. <laughs> I read when you won the Pulitzer Prize 
uh, for Housemaid of Dawn that at least the New York Times article indicated that the folks at Harper and Row, the publishers, had to think, couldn't quite remember what book that was. <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about what that was like. Your first novel, you were in your 30s, to, to win the Pulitzer, does that set up a situation where you, you know, you have anxiety after that about what you have to, to write? You were disbelieving, I understand, when you first heard of the award. Well, I, d I had no idea that, um, that my book was being considered. You know, it didn't occur to me. And I got a call from my editor at Harper and Row out of a clear blue sky. It was the 5th of May, 1969. And she said, are you sitting down? And uh, I said, yes, but I wasn't. I should have been. Uh, and she said, you've just won the Pulitzer Prize. And I think I said something like, oh, sure I have, Fran. Now, come on, what do you want? I'm busy. Then it sank, sunk in, sank in, and uh, uh, was a great moment. Um, changed my life in various ways. But you're right about the um, Harper and Row. When I, after the award was announced, um, the publisher had me to New York and and uh, feted me. But uh, I made a point of going to the sixth floor receptionist because my editor had told me that the sixth floor receptionist had submitted my novel to the Pulitzer Committee. So I made it a point to go to her and thank her. And uh, I said, tell me, how, how, uh, how did it happen that you picked my book? And she said, oh, I, well, I, I didn't pick your book. We routinely send over about half a dozen each year with no particular expectations. You just hit, hit the jackpot. And, <laughs> and that's how it happens. It's very accidental. Well, I'm sure it wasn't <laughs> totally accidental. Uh, it's a wonderful book. And also, uh, as a uh, by the by, the woman who encouraged you to submit the book in the first place, or at least some writing, was a, a former student at, uh, at, at, Stanford. at Stanford. We were, yeah. Um, she was the editor, in fact, of the uh, Stanford Literary Magazine, which is called Sequoia. And I had published poems when she was the editor. And then after we both left Stanford, uh, she went to work uh, in publishing in New York. and. We drifted apart, but she called me one day, or wrote me, and said, uh, Harper and Rowe has just uh, begun a new uh, project in poetry, the publication of books of poetry, and I remember some of your poems. Wonder if you have a manuscript. Well, I didn't, but I said, ah, I happen to be working <laughs> on a novel. Would you like to see, you know, the first chapter? And that's how, that's how it came to be, published. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about finding that voice finding a voice. Mm. Um, one, of the, one of the little tidbits in, in the series The West that intrigued me was they talked about a man who's kind of, you know, making his way to the West. He's, I don't know if he's in the Bitterroots or someplace like that. He's cold, he's tired. So he dumps everything except for a change of clothes, some food, his Bible, and his diary. And I thought listening to that, you know, nowadays somebody might take their cell phone, you know, and uh, their GI global positioning <laughs> yes. uh, right. little thing. You know, there was a time when people, you know, the series The West would not be possible without the fact that many people, including men, wrote in their diaries in those times, found their voice, established a voice. Uh, what is happening now? Are you, are you finding that the students that you teach or other people that you uh, come in contact with are, are doing that kind of writing anymore? Yes, yes. Um, it's hard to, to get a beat on that because we don't really know. Sure. My students at, um, at Arizona are keenly interested in the West, those who take my classes. They're interested in language. They're interested in oral tradition. And they're interested in writing. And I encourage them to write you know, to exercise uh, by writing uh, in a diary, for Even example. Even just a couple hundred words a day. Yeah, that you find, uh, you find your voice that way. It takes time, and you have to make the effort, but, but then you do it. Is that the main way that you encourage folks to find their voice, by simply writing as much as they can, or do you, do you have them search out certain memories um, to start finding that voice, or imitate other, other writers? Uh, all of those things, all of those things. I, I uh, encourage uh, all my students to write, uh, not, not assignments necessarily, but to keep a diary or to make uh, um, 
uh, notations about what they've seen or heard on a given day. Any kind of writing is useful, and it's, it's necessary as well. If you, first of all, you have to have the desire to, to be a writer, and n not everyone has that, of course, but someone who really and seriously wants to become a writer needs to work at it. It doesn't happen without work. Your particular voice is intriguing because you have a family background that is both, I believe we have some pictures, on one side of your family, your grandfather was uh, white, uh, predominantly white, I think there mm -hmm. was some Indian blood, here's a picture of him playing a banjo, and on the other side of your family, uh, where your name Mama Day comes from, mm -hmm. your grandfather was Native Full American. Blood Kiowa, yes. How has that influenced your your particular voice, those two traditions coming together? Uh, I think I'm fortunate because on the one side I have uh, in my ancestry, you know, the, the um, literature of, of America and England, and that's a great literature, of course. And on the other side I have this wonderful oral tradition that is far richer than any of us has ever imagined. We're still finding out how extensive it is and how vital it is. So I'm lucky in that sense. You have some poems or some uh, writings that talk about the power of the word. For you, language is extremely important. So very, word is mm -hmm. very important. You, you yeah. consider yourself a man of words. I wonder if you could read uh, this uh, particular passage, which I, f I found very nice. Yeah, here, here, a word has power in and of itself. It comes from nothing into sound and meaning. It gives origin to all things. By means of words can a man deal with the world on equal terms. And the word is sacred. A man's name is his own. He can keep it or give it away as he likes. Until recent times, the Kiowas would not speak the name of a dead man. To do so would have been disrespectful and dishonest. The dead take their names with them out of the world. That is a, that is a belief in Kiowa tradition. And so one of the <coughs> powerful words is a name that is given to somebody. The, the, the naming mm -hmm. of something gives it power, infuses it. Well, names confer being. You know, um, when, you, uh, when you say that this is a glass, you give it the name glass, and therefore it has being. You have affirmed that. You have conveyed the idea that this is. It uh, has being. So, so names are, are um, uh, in, indistinguishable from being in, in Native American culture by and large. If a man has a name, he has being. If he has no name, his being is suspect. I re yes, I remember as a child when you mentioned the glass, thinking, not understanding that other cultures could have other, well, it's just a glass, you know, why wouldn't they <laughs> call it a glass? I didn't understand yeah. why they would have another word for it. Mm -hmm. Now, you have a name yourself. Mm -hmm. um, a, an Indian name, and um, it is a manifestation of the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, mm -hmm. is it not? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the name has to do as well with bears, which are important to you. Talk well, my name uh, um, is associated with Devil's Tower, which is called Tsoai in Kiowa. It means rock tree, and Devil's Tower, after all, looks like the stump of a tree, but it's it's a monolith that uh, dominates the landscape. It rises a thousand feet from base to summit. It's uh, one of the awesome sights in the world. And I was taken there when I was an infant. It is a sacred place in Kiowa tradition. And there's a story about uh, how it came to be. And the story is about a boy and his sisters uh, who are playing a game. He's pretending to be a bear, and they are running, pretending to be afraid. And in the course of the game, the boy actually turns into a bear, and the sisters are terrified, and they, in running, they pass the stump of a tree, which speaks to them and says, if you will climb upon me, I will save you. They scamper on top of the stump, and as they do so, it rises into the air, grows up to this enormous uh, rock. And the bear comes to kill them, but they are beyond its reach. So it rears up and scores the bark all around. And the story ends, the, uh, the girls uh, are born into the sky and they become the stars of the Big Dipper. 
Well, because of that, my being taken to that place, I was given the name Rock Tree Boy. And I've always associated myself with the boy who turns into a bear. Bears are very important to me. They are not only a totem, but they are, in some sense, my identity. So, names. What does it mean for you when you turn into a bear? What, what happens and what does that do for you? Because you, you do believe that there are times when you <laughs> yeah. manifest or turn into a bear. It has different manifestations. Sometimes it's um, um, a matter of a struggle. You know, the bear gets in my way, wants to, uh, wants to play with me and, uh, and uh, distract me, and su su succeeds largely. You know, other times it's a very creative thing. You know, when, I, when the bear uh, power in me rises to the surface, I can write better than I could the moment before, and uh, I see things more clearly, uh, just generally more creative. And you're working on a series right now of writings about dialogues between a bear, the bear and God. Are yes, yes. I'm, doing a, I'm writing a book, uh, the first half of which is poems, um, the second half uh, a dialogue between Yahweh and Urset, between God and the bear. And you have a poem, <laughs> one of your newer poems, To an Aged Bear. This is one of the poems in that book. It'll be in the first half, which uh, consists of poems rather than dialogues. Uh, to an Aged Bear. Hold hard this infirmity. It defines you. You are old. Now fix yourself in summer in thickets of ripe berries and venture to the ridge where you were born. Await there the setting sun. Be alive to that old conflagration one more time. Mortality is your shadow and your shade. Translate yourself to spirit. Be present on your journey. Keep to the trees and waters. Be the singing of the soil. <clears throat> the other part of this, of this conversation about Devil's Tower, besides the bear analogy, is that the Devil's Tower as landscape. Landscape is very important to you, sense of place. There's another writing that I have appreciated of yours that talks about the need for people to take a moment and appreciate the landscape around them. I wonder if you would read that for our viewers. Once in his life, a man ought to concentrate his mind upon the remembered earth, I believe. He ought to give himself up to a particular landscape in his experience, to look at it from as many angles as he can, to wonder about it, to dwell upon it. He ought to imagine that he touches it with his hands at every season and listens to the sounds that are made upon it. He ought to imagine the creatures there and all the faintest motions of the wind. He ought to recollect the glare of noon and all the colors of the dawn and dusk. A uh, sense of place is extremely important in, uh, in uh, the worldview of the Native American. Now, a young person growing up, say, in, in <coughs> uh, a crowded city without the benefit of, of seeing a wide open space, I assume they can, they can learn to appreciate that sense of place as well as a young person. And you know they keep in their minds and imaginations a view of the West, even if they've never been in it. I think this is uh, one of the great, uh, this is why the dime novel, for example, was so successful. The uh, bank teller in, in Boston could pick up a dime novel and transport himself by imagination to the Wild West. And that, you know, the West has always been um, important to Americans in that way. Even those who never ventured into it physically, it was always in the mind, one of the great um, elements of the American imagination. You've talked as well about the need maybe for a modern day vision quest for some people, that they should take that upon themselves as Native Americans used to. What, did you, what do you mean by that and do you still feel that that is true? I think you wrote that a number of years ago. I, st I think it's true, yes. The vision quest is a wonderful um, means of, of um, finding oneself, knowing who one is in relation to the things around him. Um, Going out for several days. Mm -hmm. 
well, this is what the, this is what the Plains people did. Um, a young man who was coming of age, you know, who wanted to uh, define himself forever, this is who I am, would, would go out and fast and uh, over a period of, of days and would uh, inevitably dream um, and, and his dream, in his dream he would see who he was. He would see things that came to identify him forever. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing to do. I myself have made a vision quest. And um, people, you know, of every, uh, of every color and, and uh, uh, experience can do that in one way or another. It doesn't have to be as formalized as it was for, for the Kiowas, say, or the Lakotas. But the idea of <coughs> breaking away from the reality of of the everyday world and placing yourself in a position to dream, that's important. Many of your writings, um, and many of the voices that you hear do appear to you, or it sounds like dreams are very important to you in, mm -hmm. in, in hearing some of the past voices and the, the, the landscapes mm -hmm. that you gather for your writings. Is that, is that true? The Absolutely dreams, dreams true. are important? They are, they are very important to me, as they were to my grandparents. Ancestors going back, I think, to the Bering Bridge, you know, dreaming is that's where you, you find a certain kind of reality and vitality in your experience and not elsewhere. We're uh, running out of time. We're, you know, we're coming up on the millennium. This, yes. This, yes. The year 2000, <sighs> which of course is it's just, it, it, it's a number. Uh, but there will be, I'm sure, many people. Uh, talking about this, what does it mean? Um, within the Native American tradition, will the millennium mean anything? It'll probably be meaningful, perhaps not in the same way that it is to non-Indian people. Um, you know, the concept of time, for one thing, is different mm -hmm. uh, in that world. And so we tend to think of time, I mean, we, the larger society, we think of time in a linear way um, it passes us by. Time passes. In the Indian world, the idea is that time is rather stationary, and we pass through it. And that's an that's a important distinction. And so I think, uh, you know, the, the coming of the year 2000 is, uh, is not going to mean quite the same thing to the Indian, because it's there, and we will approach it, and we will pass it by. We will go on in, in, the, in that context of time. Well, uh, this time certainly has passed quickly <laughs> for, yeah. for me and I'm sure for our viewers. Thanks for giving them a taste of, of your beliefs and your writing. You're welcome. Appreciate your thank time. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to this edition of Dialogue. Good night. <laughs>